In 2013, the Chinese government adopted a global infrastructure development strategy to invest in nearly 70 countries and international organizations. Western media has given some of these investment projects negative labels, such as debt trap and modern time colonialism. We're here for your airport. Hand over the keys. We will hand you nothing. You will never understand the ways of our land or our airport. Too bad. Now it's China's airport. The runways, the terminals, the soggy tuna sandwiches that we made in 2019, it's all ours. But the terms of this deal are unfair. Well, then maybe you shouldn't have agreed to it. Duh. We had no choice. China, you are taking advantage of Africa's plight, locking us into onerous contracts so that you can plunder our resources. Huh? And by the way, when I say China, I'm talking about the Chinese government. Huh? I'm not talking about Chinese people, of course. You know, nothing against Chinese people. Of course. I mean, hashtag stop Asian hate. That's a short clip from a political satire produced by The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Criticizing China's economic and political involvement in Africa, led by the Belt and Road Initiative, but is this a whole picture of China's foreign policy towards Africa? Hello, I'm your guest host Abby Sen, and this is Our Voices. Before we delve into today's conversation, I'd like to introduce a short clip of a documentary film about China's cultural influence in Kenya, Behind the Belt. In the past decade, China has been deeply involved in the economic growth of the African continent. And now, under President Xi Jinping's globalization initiative called One Belt, One Road, it will invest close to a trillion US dollars in building infrastructure all across the globe. And if you're looking at the map, it shows you that Kenya is the main hub for Africa, where it will play a pivotal role in opening up the whole East African region. Both the government and the Chinese companies have made massive investments in Kenya over the past decade. And now the country is far ahead in looking at China as an example for their own development. You can already notice this across business, education, and increasingly in social initiatives as well. We are in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, to look beyond the economic headlines and to witness the force of China globalization. This documentary was produced by independent filmmaker J.D. Gore in 2017. Born in China and raised in Netherlands, Gore's personal journey shaped her unique perspective and understanding of cultural integration. She joined me for a conversation earlier this week. This project particularly was prompted by an article that I had read uh, that was kind of speaking on uh, China-Africa relationships uh, set in mainly in Nairobi. Uh, but it was like a very kind of macro, socioeconomic, and I was more curious about like, you know, why are some of the Chinese people, why did they pick uh, Kenya? And also on the flip side, it's just like, okay, well, if you are living in Nairobi and perhaps like, you know, have always grown up there uh, and all of a sudden you decide to study Chinese or you decide to uh, try to engage in business with China, like, what does that look like? It seems like there's a, shock for you because you realize um, the, the Chinese image has been perceived in a negative way. An example in the documentary, there's a part of showing how Chinese real estate developers went into Kenya market without proper research and failed to cater local needs. So um, in your opinion, what does this example manifest when you know, the Chinese trying to do business in Africa, you know, what's what's missing? What's the problem in this communication process? Yeah, I think the, the apartment example, that's at a very basic level, but but so telling of what that cultural mismatch could be. Um, so so I think it's like, you know, if someone who grew up in Kenya uh, uh, takes, a, takes a tour in that apartment, they can just really feel that, you know, it's not, the kitchen is not adjusted to their cooking habits, like, you know, their, their lounge or, or their living room is not kind of like designed to meet the needs of how people live there. But I think that this also happens everywhere around the world, because 
homeowners also get to decide for themselves which homes they are going to buy. And obviously that one came with a heavy price tag. So I feel like in that example, perhaps if it doesn't sell well, the real estate developer will learn from that and, and perhaps do an audit or, or just ask advice or do some consultancy on how they can do better next time. I want to talk about the balance of information um, from some of the stories we've heard or we've seen from media outlets. Confucius Institute has been uh, criticized um, and in perceived in a negative way that Chinese is trying to go in to dominate other culture. Um, but in your documentary, uh, you know, there's actually the side of um, some teachers at the Institute trying to uh, learn about each other, trying to create opportunities for, uh, for both sides to present themselves. When you present those information, like you said yourself, it's like snowballing and you know, uh, every single day you access new information, every single day there's a new story. How do you balance this out, try to present in a, you know, unbiased way in your documentary? It was really not about my opinion. Um, and I really wanted to just speak to people and have them also speak for themselves. So I think an example of the Confucius Institute, I didn't decide to interview anyone who was like at a really high level kind of speaking about the intention of the Confucius Institute. But instead, I tried to um I try to follow some of the teachers. I try to follow some of the students. I went to some of their uh, events and and, and dance uh, rehearsals. And at least from that part, from what I could tell was that the people that I spoke to chose to be there. For example, the student, uh, Ezra, who I spoke to, he had a very clear goal. He was actually already doing business, uh, import, export, uh, with China. And he was saying, like, you know, if I learn Chinese, it will benefit uh, me from a linguistic perspective, but also perhaps like kind of understanding like the cultural side of business, uh, of doing business a little bit better. And the other interesting example, I found the dance teacher. Um, uh, she knows Chinese dance, she knows classical dance very well, but as she was spending more time there, she was learning about like, you know, such a rich selection of kind of uh, African dance, but also body movements. And then she started creating these choreographies that had a bit of a mashup. So after we launched the documentary, we put it on YouTube. Over time, it accumulated more and more views, but especially the comment section, I think is super interesting because there was like mostly constructive dialogue about people talking about two things. One sort of like the practicality of having Chinese investment or having like kind of tools of education. And then there's like another side of the conversation that was much more value driven and value based uh, that people are like, you know, it's so hard to decouple uh education or investment from what has happened, you know, historically and and the the positions of China and Kenya. I felt like this is exactly what people need who have a stake in it is to be able to see that kind of both parts and actually just almost like directly reach out to each other, uh, whether it's in person or anonymous. It's time for a break. But first, have you experienced Chinese culture? And what's your view on China's culture influence in Africa? Please share your views on our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our handle is at VOARVoices. We're also on WhatsApp. Our number is on your screen. When we come back, we'll talk to an expert about what has been overlooked as an essential part of China's foreign policy towards Africa. We'll be right back. Welcome back, you're watching Our Voices. This week, we're talking about China's presence and influence in Africa. Before we bring in our guests, let's go to Kenya for a recap on the economic side of this conversation. Economists say China's model of investment in Africa is gaining public support, despite the debt burden it imposes on many countries. According to economic experts and the locals, the United States' multi-million dollars investment in Africa are less visible and make less of impact on people's daily lives. Victoria Amunga reports from Nairobi. 
Catherine Kiura's electronic business is one of thousands in Kenya that distributes products from both China and Western countries. Kiura says her Chinese products are moving the fastest. There's first quality, second quality to, uh, to fifth quality. So it depends with what the customer is asking for. Because we'll, we will sell something that a customer wants. If it's a bulb for 30 shillings, I have. If it's a bulb for 50 shillings, I have. Electronics is a target area of investment by Chinese companies in Africa. Locals say such investments are impacting their daily lives directly. A lot of products we see in the shops are from China. Government projects we hear are also being run by Chinese. So even though America is investing, we haven't seen them on the ground. We hear that America has done this and that, but we haven't seen them at the grassroots. Economists say the model of investment by foreign countries is key in the competition for influence across Africa. China has followed its money in. Whenever it's invested, unlike other, other lenders, it's actually followed its, uh, its projects with the engineers, sometimes even to an extreme of having their own workers. But then what that's then um, resulted in is you've had a very visible impact. During his three-nation tour of Africa, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said his country is investing in the continent without imposing unsustainable levels of debt. Wahoro told VOA that distinction is an important one. If you look in the overall picture of the, the debt stock, and by this I mean other types of, of debt beyond commercial, because China has been mainly, mainly commercial debt, uh, the West is still ahead in terms of in actual dollars on the ground, and also because uh, if you include, include the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, then the totality of that bilateral and uh, multilateral uh, institutions, you could say the West is still, this is still the West's uh, space. In a bid to strengthen relations with Africa, the White House has announced it will host an African Leaders Summit in 2022. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. Why is the United States' multi-billion dollars investment not as visible as it should be? What did we miss from China's foreign policy framework? Joining us to discuss China's soft power advantage in Africa is Dr. Lina Ben Abdallah, assistant professor at Wake Forest University, as well as my colleagues Arya Itangishaka and Amina Aliyu. In my view, one of the um, strongest competitive advantages and advantage strengths of, of China's foreign policy in the global south, specifically looking at Africa, is this focus on the people-to-people -people relations, including cultural diplomacy, including inviting African students to Chinese universities, and including these um, several seminars, workshops, platforms that the Chinese Chinese government tries to engage uh, with Africans through um, are definitely a, the backbone of China's foreign policy in Africa. So it's not an investment, um, let's say, in big ideals like peace and security and things that may or may not necessarily translate into making a difference in people's daily lives. But it's these investments that um, uh, actually make a difference in the life of a student, get in a scholarship or learning language, but gets them a job with a Chinese uh, company. Uh, these things are um, definitely what prompt uh, people to have these perceptions of China as a positive influence in countries. Uh, I want to follow up with a question about how Chinese culture is known or perceived as very conservative, very shy, um, usually not out there, but it seems lately that it has been a strategy to break that egg. And as you've mentioned, there's a university, there's cultural centers, there's the learning of language that they're that they are using to uh, sort of influence the continent on a social level. Uh, do you think that that was the actual real strategy um, by the Chinese government? And uh, do you think that the West sees that as a real threat? Yeah, I'm, I, I think definitely um, there is an emphasis by Chinese foreign policymakers and government officials to change the perception of China on the continent. You know, when you think about how uh, typically Western media, let's say France 24 or CNN or BBC, the way that they typically portray China's engagement and influence in Africa it tends to be in a negative side. So for several years now, the Chinese government has been a bit reactive to that, saying, 
look, we have to tell China's story better. It does have that impact of trying to balance, of trying to counterbalance this perceived uh, threatening and negative narratives and discourses that portray China's influence in Western media. And so you see uh, a strategy by the Chinese government to try as much as possible to report on China-Africa relations from positive light, try to establish, like you said, cultural institutes through Confucius Institutes. The idea is that, you know, if Africans get to experience China first hand, that they, they will be a little bit more sympathetic to China's presence in the continent rather than uh, and critically observe, observe, you know, sort of that negative discourse that comes from uh, European uh, media. So there is public diplomacy strategy backed by billions of dollars from the Chinese government, which try to correct for that. So in the same article on uh, foreign affairs, you list a few, you know, China Africa um, leadership summit or sort of culture exchange programs compared to what China has been doing in the past decades. Um, the United States haven't been having one things Obama administration. So if the United States, Washington wanted to compete on the culture level um, or the people to people relationship level, um, what would you recommend? Yes, indeed. Um, that's a very good question. I mean, I think the most important thing about um, China's investments in this people to people relations and in this human capital and social capital relations with Africa is, is consistency. Right? Every three years, you see that the Chinese government hosts uh, or co hosts a forum. Uh, whether it's at a uh, kind of a uh, uh, heads of government or a state leaders level, uh, ministerial level or, or, or uh, president level summit that to happen. So it happened through COVID, it happened after COVID, before COVID. It is this consistency that creates trust in that reliability in the relationship. Um, this consistency also creates, it puts a, 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 a structure around feedback on listening to issues, listening to, you know, the relationship is not perfect, it's far from it, but uh, it institutionalizes this cooperation is what's important. And that's why when you contrast it to what the US has done under the Obama administration, I mean, it was a big level summit. Um, African presidents were very happy to go to DC and meet. The problem with that was that it was a one-time kind of summit deal. And then when the Trump administration uh, took place, that well, momentum that working. Obama created, a lot of it was lost in terms of visa bans, travel bans on several African countries. The U.S. is going to have Biden administration is planning another one of these summits. So there's going to be an Africa, U.S. Africa summit again. My wish is to see that taken a bit more consistently. Why? Because then it shows interest. It shows to Africans who are interested in this relationship and not just because we want to counter China, then we're going to host these African leaders, parade them over to D.C., photo op, take pictures, you know, and then get some speeches going and then see you next decade. So the idea here is to build some, some reliable momentum that shows to Africans, African leaders, that the US is ready to think about them as partners, to see them as partners in a serious partnership rather than uh, a one-time off kind of thing. We've seen how much impact Hollywood has had on the world at large, right? Should we expect to see that, um the younger generation are going to move away from, say, um, romantic Hollywood, more towards like Chinese history and Chinese culture. Are we going to see a shift in that kind of media dynamic? We are definitely, when we compare, for instance, the, the Chinese movie scene or Chinese culture scene in the continent 10 years ago to today, we do see that there is a huge leap forward. There's an improvement in terms of how, uh, for instance, young African entrepreneurs uh, are learning Chinese, for instance, are fluent in Mandarin. For instance, we see sometimes sort of in terms of how popular martial arts are, you know, the question of whether it's going to be to the magnitude of sort of, you know, Hollywood uh, soft power, that that's that's a question for time to tell us in, in, in all honesty, just because it is still the fact that a lot of Africans don't know much about China. I mean, especially you brought up Nigeria with, with Nollywood itself. It's a thriving industry, definitely um, big internationally as well. So I think there still is a lot of um, way to go in terms of 
popularizing Chinese culture, um, you know, uh, at, at that uh, kind of uh, Hollywood level. It's time for a break. When we return, we'll take a look at the long history between Africa and China long before the Belt and Road Initiative. Stay with us. Empowerment and humanity towards a better world. Economic and social progress of every society. Facts and information from key players rather than spectators in politics, business, science and technology. City, Wura, educated, all underprivileged. We care and we listen to what matters to you. Your, your voices, voices are our voices. Welcome back, you're watching Our Voices. This week, we're talking about China's presence and influence in Africa. In the past decade, China's economic involvement in Africa has dominated the headlines in many Western media outlets. But China's presence in Africa actually dates back centuries. The Chinese have been present in Africa since the 1600s, with many carving out living as laborers and business owners. The continent's largest community of Chinese immigrants and their descendants are now in South Africa, where families remember how they escaped poverty in their homeland and preserve in the face of discrimination to become a key part of South Africa's rainbow nation. A term coined by Archbishop Desmond Tutu to describe post-apartheid South Africa after the country's first fully democratic election in 1994. Kate Barley reports from Johannesburg. These days, China is South Africa's biggest trade partner. But ties between the two cultures began back in the 1600s, with Chinese convicts arriving from a Dutch colony in what is now Indonesia. Then, in the 1800s, the first Chinatown in South Africa was built here on Commissioner Street in inner city Johannesburg. Chinese migrants, attracted by South Africa's gold rush, set up shop in what is now a decrepit and dangerous area, establishing what would become the mining city's first Chinatown. But migrants encountered racism in South Africa long before a white supremacist system of apartheid was ushered in back in 1948. The Chinese were banned from mining and faced other kinds of discrimination. The Chinese, with everyone else here, being classified um, uh, as part of a particular racial group, there were only certain things that were open to you. So you technically, you could only go to school and live in the areas that were designated for you. People of different races were even barred from marrying. That didn't stop third-generation Chinese South African Yolandi Drea and her husband Wynard, who risked being sent to jail. Because we were breaking a law that's on the statute, and you know, they could have definitely have arrested us. We get every now and then uh, a comment from the next generation. Thank goodness for guys like you, because you made things so much easier for us. Because we were kind of... Uh, breaking the mold at the time we were, we were pushing against quite a lot of resistance. Things have changed in South Africa since the advent of democracy in 1994. Now there are Chinese South Africans in government, like Michael Sun, a Johannesburg city councillor who is with the opposition Democratic Alliance. But, he says, racism is still a problem. I've been many times a victim in terms of racism and, uh, you know, bigotry, uh, racial slurs. You know, it happens in the United States too. I think this is where the, 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 the Stop Asian Hate movement started. You know, we really need to you know, start something similar in, in South Africa. South Africa's old Chinatown was a hub for early arrivals, who were mostly Cantonese speakers from China's south. Now, as more Mandarin speakers move in, there is a new Chinatown, in Cyrildine, a safer suburb. Some 350,000 ethnic Chinese residents are now estimated to be living in South Africa, where they are part of the Rainbow Nation movement to celebrate the country's fusion of diverse cultures and people. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. Even though there has been waves of immigrants from China to Africa in recent years, some families made that journey decades ago. VOA's Kang Chong Chen has more from Nairobi about a Chinese Kenya and his restaurant. From popcorn chicken to beef chow fung, this restaurant has been offering famous street foods from Hong Kong since it opened in 2020. But the Cantonese eatery called Dragon Eye is located in Nairobi. We do a lot of uh, like a char siu bao, which is very popular in Hong Kong. 
Uh, we do the, the typhoon shelter uh, crab, typhoon shelter prawns. There are also coastal Swahili style kebabs that cannot be found anywhere else in Nairobi. Owner Henry Tin was born and raised in Mombasa. He speaks English, Kiswahili, Cantonese, and a bit of Mandarin. His father, originally from Hong Kong, arrived in Kenya by ship during World War II to escape the Japanese occupation of China. Tin worked as a maritime engineer for 18 years. An economic downturn caused his family to move to Nairobi and pivot to the restaurant industry. My mother was a good cook, okay. so we cooked Chinese food. Okay. But I ate together with my house help and uh, yeah. my, my neighbors, they were all Africans. So I was used to uh, ugali and uh, yeah. the local food. Yeah. And of course, uh, Mombasa used to climb the trees, get mangoes <laughs> and uh, baobab and all those yeah. things. Yeah. Tin's mother initially taught the staff at their first restaurant. Then his wife, a Hong Kong native and trained chef, stepped in. In recent years, a new wave of migrants from China has arrived in Kenya to work on infrastructure projects linked to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Some Kenyans are wary of China's growing presence and find it difficult to overcome the language and culture differences. But for Ten, who was born and raised in Kenya, he says he feels wholly accepted by Kenyans, both as a citizen and within society. You know, China did a lot of investment here. Yeah, in, in the beginning, they don't know much about China. Now they know a lot about China, and uh, the Kenyan people are very friendly, especially Mombasa, Nairobi. I can walk about, integrate with them, talk in Swahili. There is also a small community of people from Hong Kong living in Nairobi. Others emigrated in search of a different life and business opportunities, such as restaurants that cater to growing Chinese populations across East Africa. Number one, they bring the culture here. Uh, a, lot of Chinese, a, a lot of Chinese also got married to the local people. Uh, they are doing farming in Kenya. Ten says it's easier now to get more ingredients and vegetables like bok choy for his restaurant. He's hoping a growing Chinese presence in Kenya will mean more business for him. For VOA News, Kang Jing Chang, Nairobi. Foreign policies often carry the political and economic agendas of the respective nations. But as more developed countries try to gain traction in Africa to compete for resources and market share, what are the likely culture side effects? At the end of the day, what matters the most are people. As Jilly Bo says in her documentary, it is up to the next generation to shape the society. That's all for this week. On behalf of my Our Voices colleagues and everyone here at Voice of America, I'm Abby Sun. Thank you for watching.